Welcome, everyone. Good evening. It's great to have you here. I'm James Brooks, president of SAR. We're continuing now the second of our uh, membership lecture series for the year. This year, uh, we're theming it around our notable alumni. Nick Spitzer is an alum. He held an NEH fellowship at SAR in 1995 and 96, working on a project called Creole Aesthetics and American Culture, Zydeco and Mardi Gras in French Louisiana, which you will get um, rather a taste of this evening. He is the producer and host of American Roots, Routes, or Ruts, depending on where in the country you hail from. He uh, is a folklorist and a professor of anthropology and American studies at Tulane University. He specializes in American music and cultures of the Gulf South, received a PhD in anthropology from the University of Texas in 1986, with his dissertation on Zydeco music and Afro-French Louisiana culture and identities. A fellow of the American Folklife Society, Nick received the Society's Benjamin Botkin Lifetime Award in Public Folklore and the New Orleans Mayor's Lifetime Achievement and Arts Award, as well as in 2006 being named Louisiana Humanist of the Year for his cultural recovery efforts after the Hurricane Katrina catastrophe, about which we will be hearing much more this evening. So please join with me in welcoming Nick Spitzer. Well, the, the first thing you have to say in radio is this thing on. Can you hear me? Uh, it's, I think you can. Um, well, none of it would have been possible without being at SIR, let me tell you. <laughs> I learned a lot there and got a lot of great things done. And in a lot of ways, American Roots emerged from that period, as well as work on, on creolization. And tonight, I'm going to talk really more about New Orleans creolization after the uh, deluge, the catastrophe of 2005, rather than rural French Louisiana, which was uh, what I was working on at the time. And the uh, application of the idea of creolization to broader settings and the questions of you know, how culture is used uh, by peoples worldwide in all kinds of catastrophic situations, not just natural or man-made disasters, but political disasters, economic disasters. We know about those, uh, as well as globalization, concerns for cultural loss, environmental uh, disasters. I won't detail each one. I'll just simply suggest that we've learned a lot about culture and its power, particularly intangible culture, from what happened in New Orleans. But, but I've always thought that northern New Mexico and southern Louisiana have something in common. Uh, first of all, there are two very strong American regional cultures, if you want to look at it in the classic notion of region that folklorists like. Uh, you know, the anthropologists used to go for culture area and think worldly and operate in this sort of large global colonial, uh, post-colonial world, and the folklorists tended to be inside the nation states. Uh, we, we don't divide it up that way so much, but we do still talk about regions, not so much their homogeneity, but the diversity of them and their power. And I think both southern Louisiana, with its great music traditions and its um, deep Catholic traditions uh, that relate to carnival uh, and other forms of ritual and festival and food. Um, it's phenomenal. And similarly, northern New Mexico with its uh, uh, contact uh, between Native American, uh, Latin, Anglo, others uh, to create a society that's quite remarkable. And, and I always say that Louisiana seems to lead, lean a little towards more towards public music making. And of course, New Orleans is a, a huge uh, flowing font of music, whereas I think of northern New Mexico as music's a little more subtle and pulled back uh, and, and a little more private. But on the other side of the ledger uh, is the, the visual arts and the crafts, the material culture, the beauty of the landscape and how the built environment articulates with the landscape. Um, you know, they both have major uh, non-English European populations at their base, French Louisiana, though there was a Spanish period, and of course, Spanish New Mexico. They both have major um, non-European populations. If here, of course, Native Americans and in Louisiana, uh, enslaved and then later freed, free people of color and, and freed slaves, African descendants, um, both very Catholic, both very colonial, feudalistic in certain ways. <laughs> Politics are interesting in both places. Um, the one area of great difference is there's this, there's this gigantic arrow sticking between them that separates our, we blood brothers uh, called Texas. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and you know, if we, if we could bring New Mexico our water and you could give us a little less flooding, you know, we'd all be in good shape. But anyway, I, I'm stimulated by both places and I think it has a lot to do with the vernacular forms um, of expressive culture. And let me turn to that with Louisiana by playing a tune that we use um, as, our, as our theme song um, in times on American roots. Mm -hmm. 
Test your cultural literacy. Anyone know this too? Yell it out. Tipitina, that's right. Professor Longhair tune. Played here by Alan Toussaint. Listen, listen to it now. It's got blues elements, blue notes, jazz improvisation elements, classic progression that would ultimately lead to rhythm and blues and rock and roll, originally recorded in 1948. A little of the what Jelly Roll Morton called the Latin tinge in the way the rhythm comes out. And I would argue aspects of 19th century Louisiana classicism, Louis Murrow Gottschalk, the great uh, composer, one of America's sort of first great composer and touring uh, figures in classical music. He died 30 years before Jelly Roll Morton was born. Now, thank you, Mr. Tucson. I've succeeded in talking over that, which is not good. Normally, I don't go through all that when we open the show because the music does speak for itself but I know you're t tuned into the anthropological, folkloric, ethnomusicological side of things so I wanted to say those things because that one minute version of Tipitina embeds an awful lot of things, not just the various cultural sources that I spoke of but also the notion of a piano professor he learned, Alan Toussaint who's very much alive today and is a writer of over 800 songs and you know many of them even though you don't know that Toussaint wrote them, um, learned to some degree from a man named Professor Longhair, Henry Roland Byrd. And in learning from Longhair, he picked up that left hand that sounds so Caribbean and gives you that Latin tinge on many of the pieces of music. Um, this idea of a piano professor, though, is somebody that gains their authority and authenticity uh, not because they've been schooled at Juilliard or any great music uh, school in the United States or anywhere, but because they have the ability to play a certain sound, and in this case, commingle the sounds and create something new out of the old parts. And this is fundamental creolization of culture, where you take these strains from various places and you create something new. And I argue not just that much of the world is creolized, some of it more obviously uh, than other parts, less assimilated and more creolized the more we look at it, but, but that particular places like Louisiana and parts of the Afro-Atlantic are particularly creolized and people talk about it that way. And part of the creolization that goes forward links it to this oral tradition of the vernacular. So there was a piano professor before you and that was Professor Longhair. And before there was Professor Longhair, there were many, many people, but one stood out, and that was Jelly Roll Morton, who you may know of as what, considered one of the first great sort of architects of jazz. And so here's Toussaint, who learns not just rhythm and blues in the neighborhood and directly from Professor Longhair, but as he once told me, he listened to classical radio, and it was, as he would say, intensely classical. Um, this is sort of the official shot. He's always a dapper gentleman. However, um, some things happened uh, in 2005 that put Alan Toussaint into a new role uh, in, in Louisiana and New Orleans. And I want to kind of run through some of what went down here. Let's see. We should be advancing. Okay. You've heard him play that. I want you to listen to him playing this variation um, on what you just heard, Tipitina. this Tipitina and Me. It's a minor key version. You slowed down. We recorded it the same day we recorded the other theme, around 2000. And in 2005, I used it as the soundtrack for the first program we went on the air with. Now, one of your most Whoa, famous sorry songs. about that, folks. Why did that do that? Well, let's just, I just want to give you that, have, you have that bed sitting there. Uh, we recorded it then, but we used it in that period when the city was deluged and we were going on the air. So it became a kind of a, a mournful moment. And it also, I think, you know, it has its own kind of darkness, yes, but there's a luminous undercurrent to it as well. So let's look at the city in that period. Here's the normal shot of New Orleans, just to refresh. Big crescent of the Crescent City, Lake Pontchartrain, Mississippi River. Does it flow north or south? You tell me. <laughs> Eventually it goes north. Here's the flood zone. The high ground is by the levees. All the canals that burst are along the top and the backwater flooding all the way back to the high ground of the levees. This is the 19th century footprint of the city. This is where, if the, that had happened, 
in the 19th century, the back swamps would have flooded up and out, but everything else would have been fine. So I always argue that what happened to New Orleans was not so much um, its antiquity and problems with what came before, but its bad modernity. So Tucson sets the mood there with what he's playing. And that particular tune ended up uh, on a, uh, a CD that we'll mention in a moment that helped raise funds for the recovery. And as we aired it, for the same reason that the other, other version of Tipitina uh, speaks to creolization, this creates a mood that says something's different with the radio, something's different from that signal from Louisiana. The only other time we'd used it before this was right after 9-11 to the piano professor who almost offhandedly had done it at the time. Again, to review the situation just briefly. That's French Quarter, which actually got very little damage comparatively. So here's Tucson. What happens to Tucson? Well, he evacuates right after the catastrophe. He actually ends up in a hotel. And I'm going to play you some audio of Alan Tucson from about two weeks after the deluge, when he's in New York, staying at a club uh, and getting ready to perform at Madison Square Garden for what had become really the first uh, major uh, fundraiser. It's called Big Easy Big Apple for the Big Easy. First major fundraiser based on culture and bringing people together that night. It was Bill Clinton, John Fogarty, New Orleans brass bands, uh, Fats Domino, all these different people. And here's Tucson that night. Hardly anything because I was planning on going well, back let me, the next Let me morning. recue for what you. What kind of belongings were you able to scrape together to get out of town with? Hardly anything because I was planning on going back the next morning and that was it. So everything else was at the mercy of our arch enemy lady, Katrina. The bottom floor of my house had seven or eight feet of water. So everything in my room where I do my editing and writing and arranging and all of the musical things that I do, and it's all gone. In that room, I assume, is at least one piano. Oh, yes, my Steinway is the most important thing there, and then everything that surrounds it, like synthesizers, recording equipment, and uh, all of my records, and, and it's all gone. Yes, sorry to say, but the spirit didn't drown. I think I care more about the city than my own personal material losses. I have thought about those things for a moment, but I immediately begin thinking, how exciting it's going to be to rebuild, replace. And I'm so glad that I was in New Orleans to witness this great event. It brought an opportunity that we can take advantage of in such a wonderful way, and I'm eager to get started. So here he is, amazingly, obviously sad, thinking about all this. But look, listen to what he says right at the end. And we were able to get that out onto national air and give the inside view of a major cultural figure, what I came to call uh, these cultural citizens in Tucson right at the top there. And it, it, it is remarkable that he had that composure, I think, to be able to talk about that. And he also made a key distinction we always talk about uh, in anthropology, which is the distinction between uh, intangible culture and, and material forms. And uh, you know, the idea that, that, that the spirit didn't drown then leads you to to no waterline on music, which he said in a separate interview, and, and uh, you know, to which we add no waterline on the soul. What that meant, at very simple but profound terms, was that the that, that Tucson and everybody else who was involved in music would continue to teach, continue to play, to share their knowledge. And it, it led very early on to my feeling that the city would only be rebuilt with music meaning the return of the musicians, the reopening of the clubs and the dance halls, the return of Carnival, the return of the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, the reopening of the studios. That would signify that the leaders of the cultural citizenry were back and making something happen. And Tucson ended up with a couple of tracks on this record, which Nunsuch put out and raised a million and a half for Habitat for Humanity. So early on, the linkage was made with the big, big fundraiser in New York and then this record between the power of the culture and the need to rebuild infrastructure. Now, you got to remember at the same time this was happening, there was also the issues of city, state, and federal um, 
lack of ability to respond quickly. And we, I won't dwell on that history, um, except to say that every urban planner I met was talking about infrastructure, infrastructure. We've got to fix New Orleans. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. And I would go around the country with a couple building trades guys, and, a, and one of them was a musician. Uh, and, and invariably, you know, we'd come to, the, to this note, that there was nobody we knew who grew up in New Orleans uh, and stayed there or, or was going to return, or anybody that arrived as a tourist or a new uh, member of the local society that cared about the infrastructure of the city. I mean, <laughs> it's not a city of great infrastructure. If you want for infrastructure, you go to Chicago or you go to Iowa. You, know, <laughs> you don't go to New Orleans for that. It is the intangible culture that was threatened. And the big concern became, what will happen with all these places that produce music and produce culture that the world loves because they went there for the honeymoon or they went there on spring break or because they ate some gumbo once somewhere or, or a you know, jazz band toured uh, to East Berlin in the early 60s and, and you know people went, oh my God, the West, freedom. All the different things that New Orleans symbolizes to America, its mixture of cultures, its sense of bon vivantism. Uh, I would add it's hard work that it hasn't always gotten touted as much, but all the things that make it a special city south of the South and north of the Caribbean kind of came came into a, a, a higher sort of level of focus. And this recording, which I'll come back to, was helpful in making that point. One of the other cultural citizens uh, of this time uh, is Irma Thomas, who actually had had a bunch of hits that Alan Toussaint helped produce. And I'll play you a little bit of uh, Irma Thomas here. Now, one of your most famous songs is a song about the weather. It's... I don't know why that control is doing that to me. Sorry, guys. For some reason, my picture controls <laughs> seems to be jumping onto my uh, my laptop. Don't ask me quite why. Uh, let's get it's raining going again for you. Now, one of your most famous songs is a song about Keep the it weather. Okay. It's raining. How do you listen to "It's Raining"? You song you've sung so many times over the years. How does it sound to you when you hear it now? Oh, it has a lot more meaning now. But you know, "It's Raining" was a love song, and it's still going to be a love song as far as I'm concerned. So well, maybe now it's a love song for New Orleans itself. It is. It's definitely a love song for New Orleans. It's raining. This is Irma today. Look like it's gonna rain all night. I did not get this. Maybe I'll just hand advance this, okay? That'll work. Let me go back into the middle of the track where we were. This song, It's Raining, is sort of emblematic of the idea that... Uh, you could take a love song and you could reframe it into a new setting. Some classic New Orleans music could be understood as something different than what it had been originally, which is a romance tune and a tune about uh, sadness in, you know, on the cityscape. And suddenly it becomes, as she was about to say there, uh, a, a, now, one of your a most song famous for song. the city you know, itself. I wish the night would hurry up. I mean, I have a moment that I can remember at the Jazz Fest when I walked on stage and just as I got on stage, the sky opened up and it started raining and nobody moved. I made it raining my opening song, which I normally don't do. And that was a special, special moment. You've uh, recently dug into a classic from Bessie Smith. Tell me a little bit about the Bessie Smith song you've got. It's the Backwater Blues song. It, it is so poignant. There's a line in there that said it thundered and lightning and the winds began to blow. And the next line it says, and there's thousands of people that has no place to go. And I'm one of them. But yes, I do have a place to go. I can go back to New Orleans when it's rebuilt. When it rains five days and the sky beginning of an example of something that we started to see, which is that people reevaluated their roles in the city. Irma Thomas, who in my mind could be mayor of New Orleans if Mitch Landrieu hadn't run, she supported him. She knows so much about the politics and the history, but she's a feisty person. She had, she had like four kids by the age of 18. Uh, when the economy dropped out in the 60s, she moved to Los Angeles and sold uh, car parts for Sears. She knows her way around 
big monster fuel engines and all that kind of stuff. And yet in her career, she stuck to the image of the soul queen, that classic music that emerges out of gospel and is about, you know, romance and finance and generally positive vibes compared to the blues, which kind of focuses on the down and the tough, um, you know, in its own way. So here she is saying, I will sing blues because of what happened, but I will find out who I could emulate. So she digs up Bessie Smith, and Bessie Smith wrote very few songs, but in the mid-20s, right in 1927, when floods had uh, covered the Ohio Valley, and then we had flooding in Louisiana, she was singing this song, Backwater Blues. And so Irma digs into Backwater Blues and updates her repertoire, using the catastrophe kind of in a way that Toussaint foretold, that this is an opportunity. And she's gone on to win a Grammy and have a whole revived career. And we'll touch on that a little bit more in just a moment. Now I'm going to go ahead and play you uh, what this, this device was, keeps trying to play for you. <laughs> Johnny St. Cyr, Louis Armstrong, this is from Louis Armstrong's Hot Fives in 1925. This picture of Johnny St. Cyr is from the 50s. Now Johnny St. Cyr is an uptown Creole from the Carrollton area, Creole in the sense of French, Afro, Spanish, the mixed notion of Creole, not strictly the pure French notion of Creole from the colonial period. Johnny St. Cyr uh, grew up in a plastering family, as did many descendants of free people of color. These are antebellum free people, of which Louisiana had an unusually high percentage owing to the French Code Noir and uh, the, the Spanish law that came after it that allowed people to uh, buy their own freedom, be freed for good acts, a whole variety of ways that people got free and began to build a culture. And many of the people um, that were known were the craftspeople who had been incredibly valuable. People who could do carpentry, could do um, iron works, wrought iron work, masonry, bricklaying, and great plastering. If you've been to New Orleans, you know there's a lot of amazing plaster in the city. But Johnny St. Cyr is so interesting to me because everyone looks at New Orleans as les le bon temps, relais, and joie de vivre. And it is that. But it's also a town of incredibly hard work, whether it's in the port uh, or in the oil fields uh, or, or in these building trades, which had huge prestige in the Creole and color communities. And the women's side of that was seamstress work and a variety of other sort of fashion design things that basically fine craft work is in, embedded in the city as well as hard work. And so in the late 20s, uh, while he was on tour with Armstrong, he made a decision to leave Louis Armstrong and come back to New Orleans and work as a plasterer. And that may sound mysterious to people who think, hey, you're out with Louis Armstrong. But Sincere talks about it quite strongly in the Jelly Roll Morton uh, biography, autobiography with Alan Lomax, in which he basically says that a, a craftsman plays better music because he really cares when he plays. He's not just doing it for money. A craftsman is a strong person. He doesn't need the whiskey. He doesn't need the money. He plays the music because the music is who he is. And that was kind of in juxtaposition um, to this gentleman here, Jelly Roll Morton who grew up in a family of free people, uh, descendants of free people in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, but who didn't want to be a bricklayer like his father. And so he was sort of taunting Jelly Roll Morton when he said that. And you can see that we had his Johnny St. Cyr, John A. St. Cyr. It doesn't say banjo player, it says plasterer on that last image. Um, but, it, but it speaks to this reality that there, there is a deep sense of respect in work in New Orleans, especially in the building trades, building artisans who have not just created the city, but who also repair the city. And suddenly, building artisans after Katrina, when you're 150,000 dwellings down, become really, really important. And many of these building artisans were like St. Cyr or the family of Jelly Roll Morton or the family of Sidney Bechet, and they were tradespeople. And so jazz in New Orleans historically is a community-based music. Alan Lomax came to the conclusion that jazz was kind of a folk music in New Orleans. He had been despondent when bebop came around because he saw everybody sitting in a circle and playing for one another and playing music that was less danceable. And then comes cool jazz and kind of blue and miles. Don't get me wrong, I love all that stuff. But for Lomax, the folklorist, he was looking for community and region. And Jelly Roll's explanation 
of culture in New Orleans and jazz, as would Johnny St. Cyr's explanation be when Lomax did a follow-up interview with him, was that jazz is part of community culture. It's for dancing. It's for carnival parades. It's for social aid and pleasure clubs. Social aid and pleasure clubs. For Creoles, like Jelly Roll Morton, though, there has always been this sort of sense of allying themselves with the grand old aristocracy of the city in the use of the term Creole. So listen, here's, here's Lomax talking to Jelly Roll Morton in 1938 at the Library of Congress. can understand, my folks were in the city of New Orleans long before the Louisiana Purchase, and all my folks came directly from the shores, or not the shores, I mean from France. We always had some kind of a musical instruments in the house. We had lots of them, and everybody always played for their pleasure. But of course, the families, never, the family, I mean, never had an idea that they wanted musicians in the family to make a living. They always had it in their mind that a musician was a tramp. Other than, uh, other than the exceptions, with the exceptions of uh, the French opera house players, which they always patronized. They only thought there was the great musicians in the country. In fact, I myself was inspired by going to the French Opera House once. Because the fact of it was I liked to play piano. And the piano was known at that time to be an instrument for a lady. So I had and in my mind that if I played piano, I would be misunderstood. Jelly Roll, uh, the biography, by the way, autobiography of Lomax, is one of the great oral histories in American life, and it also is one of the great jazz oral histories and documents, and I recommend it to you. It's very funny, and if you know New Orleans, you learn a great deal about detail of cultural life in New Orleans from Jelly Roll. But he says a couple of things in there that are really emblematic of the society. One, some of the light-skinned descendants of free people of color did not necessarily want to associate with blacks, and so he orients himself towards France. Uh, that's not universal in the scene, but it certainly is a particular perspective. And in his case, he often talked about African Americans as being able to play hot and being sort of mad with music, but not people he would associate with. And that's a classic split in New Orleans. Shared culture, social separation. And he's aff affiliating himself with the old Creole elite, whether they're of color or Creole Blanc. He's making sure that you kind of uh, know that. So in a sense, he's speaking to not so much the Creolization I was talking about at the beginning, uh, though there's an element of it, French, African, but more a kind of a class Creolization. He goes to the opera house, and he doesn't want to be misunderstood, and all these other things that are there. Well, let's, let's update to uh, around 2005, and I want you to meet this gentleman, Edwin Bocage. Let's talk a little bit about your uh, your life in New Orleans. Over the years, not only have you played music, you've done so many things, and one of the things I know you've done is you've been a craftsman. Tell me a little about your background in, in construction and crafts. Well, uh, we, we as Bocage had to learn to do uh, the craftsman when he was five. All the males had to learn how to start off and build because they were all builders, and uh, I, think, I think we also had shipbuilders, and, and we had uh, construction engineers and in the family. So they taught us what, what might be of interest to us and what might help us out as far as um, having another skill other than what you choose. Mm -hmm. If you choose something, if you tend to choose something else, you would always be able to fall back on that. Mm -hmm. And what skills did you learn as a builder? In, in, uh, for well, I, I, brick, brick laying and, and uh, carpentry was, was uh, basically what, what my dad did. And so, so I had to learn to do it too. Did you like that work when you did it? Or is oh, it... Yeah. yeah. Yes. I love it as much as the music. Really? 
Yes, indeed. I, I love to stand back and look at what I've put together. When was the last time you uh, you had a hammer in your hand or a trowel? I mean, is, is it, has it been a while? or is uh, it? No, it's uh, a couple of weeks ago I was in Mississippi, and uh, I had to rearrange some parts of the roof. <laughs> <laughs> But in this ca- in the other case in New Orleans, I part of, a partial part of the roof blew off. So uh, I got to reconstruct that after I find an adjuster and we try to get something together. I'm going to wear my face. Of course, Eddie Bow on piano now. Can anyone call this one out? Doesn't sound like he, Yeah, that's right, Saints. It's a little harder to detect. Kind of a barrel house piano solo here. One of the things I love about Eddie Bowe is that he takes the received tradition, improvises on it, and turns it into something fresh every time he'd play it. This was a very important thing to have said in 2005 because the compass was spinning for so many New Orleanians. And so here's Eddie Bowe, another cultural citizen, talking about return and making this recording and improvising on the old song and making it fresh again for whoever might hear it. And it's on that same Nunsuch record, and it was just great to work with him. And we had to record it in Lafayette because everything in New Orleans was dark at that point. So it was a, an effort to get together, find people, and work on some of these things. And of course, here's a, here he is a building tradesman. And the, and the conversation um, was partly recorded before and partly after Katrina. The, the part about uh, you know, getting together with an, uh, you know, an adjuster and working something out, that's all Katrina repair work. This man was in his late 70s doing carpentry at that point. The last time I saw him, he was at my door in his, his carpentry whites, you know, standing there coming by to you know, do something or talk about something, and he has since passed on. I wanted to show you some of these images, though, of the city. This is a raised shotgun house. This is a very much a middle-class house in the French Quarter, but here's the, uh, the sort of shotgun models. Well, there, there's a little gingerbread, the, what we call Westlake Victorian, but here's your classic shotgun, not very fancy here, in need of the attention of Eddie Bowe or another great you know, architectural craftsman, um, but it is the classic shotgun, the image that if you fired a shot in the front door, it would go out the back and not hit any walls because everything's down the center. But um, these shotguns, if you've ever looked in the the landscapes of uh, Jamaica or Haiti, uh, the lower south, the shotgun house is pretty spread far and wide, and there's, there's a, quite a bit of good research on the, on the notion that the shotgun house has uh, uh, West African roots and has been modified in the Caribbean and um, became slave housing, and then it became free people housing, and little by little you start doing this, you raise it up, you make it double wide, you add the gingerbread and the paint job, and it becomes middle class housing uh, in a lot of these communities. And so people that built shotgun houses and repair them suddenly become really important in New Orleans shotguns and Creole cottages. But not only that, also the people that have done the very strongly decorative work. I, I call Earl Barte the Jelly Roll Morton of plastering <laughs> for several reasons. One is he could talk just as well as Jelly Roll. And Jelly Roll is one of the great raconteurs in a town where bragging is kind of a traditional art form. But you know, as with musicians, plasters, it's not bragging, as Dizzy Dean would say, if you can do it. <laughs> and and here, here's Barthe um, talking a little bit ab- about his family lineage. And I might add, uh, he looks a bit like the, the planter there. Um, this is on his photo day for a museum exhibit called Raised to the Trade, Creole Building Arts of New Orleans that we, we did about 10 years ago. I wanted you to see him there uh, rather than strictly uh, out on the job. Let's see if we can get Mr. B to talk. Well, I came from a little place to call Nice. Nice, France. It's on the Mediterranean. Just like Jelly Roll. And from there, my great-great-grandfather, I was told, stopped in Haiti. Oh, I can add something. And he met a beautiful Haitian woman and came here to New Orleans. So he acknowledges. And 
uh, that's, I think, where we got started from, both days. We go back, we say 1850. Uh, my dad naturally passed all this information down to me, and I passed it down to my children, and Trudy passes it down to Lauren, my granddaughter, and we hope it'll continue like that. Um, it's something you should know, living in the South, living in New Orleans, that the Barthes, in 1901, organized the Plasters Union. So you might say, well, what's so great about that? It was integrated. That's what's so great about it. And it's, it never, they had unions were segregated. The Plasters Union never was. And it was the Barthes and the Balls organized the Plasters Union. And we uh, controlled it or operated it for the 150 years. And uh, at this hour, it's not in existence. Uh, they, uh, I guess they're going to get it back. But right now, there's nothing happening too much with that. Let me say one thing about this. First of all, the great-granddaughter, Lauren, uh, got, a, got an MA in historic preservation from Johns Hopkins. <laughs> so that's what's happening in that family. And he, and he couldn't convince her to become a plaster. Uh, two of his sons became plasters. And the other is a businessman that manages the Barthé business. And he, too, uh, has since passed on. But uh, Mr. Barthé was also the first plasterer to receive a National Heritage Award from the National Endowment for the Arts. And he makes a strong analogy between uh, plastering and music. Um, and I, I just want to uh, show you uh, a little bit uh, about uh, the work that was done by the Barthes over six or seven generations, depending on how, how you count it. But I also need to add this footnote. When he's talking about integrating the union, this is kind of like... Plessy versus Ferguson. What he did, what, his, what, what the, the ancestor did, was cre creoles of color like him and Euro European, particularly Irish and Italian, English name people, German name people, they were in the union together. Black people, you know, uh, were, black Americans, English speaking Protestant black people, African Americans were not in the union. But to Mr. Barte's great credit, he integrated the union that way in the 1970s. So it's fascinating to me that a man positioned as he was, you know, sort of between colors, between cultures, um, fully Creole in the middle of things, had this expansive view. And at the same time, back to the family level. Let's hear what he has to say. I take my kids riding on a streetcar. Say, see that house? But there's work on that one. See that theater? But there's work there. So you might say, what are you doing that for? We're trying to instill in their mind that we have, we are part of this culture. And my kids, it was the same thing. They are Stuck at everybody. We're not, we don't need to uh, prove nothing to nobody. It's already there. And any, listen to me, any historic building in this city, and there's hundreds of them, both has had something to do with them. From the Superdome, that's the <laughs> largest plaster building, you know, plaster in the south. There's no other one building. The Superdome had 193 plasters, and I was a representative for all of them. So let me say, I mean, obviously the Superdome is not an historic, well, it's, it's historic modernism now. If you've ever seen it, it looks like a, a spaceship that landed in the Third Ward. Um, and it's been renovated quite fancily since Katrina from a variety of sources. But there were a lot of plaster walls in it. And as, you know, that's not uh, the, the high-end decorative plaster work that was being done there. But those other bits were all Barthé work, including the cathedral I showed you at the beginning. Didn't tell you that St. Louis Cathedral, where I went with him to look at his great-grandfather's signature inside a little area just below the steeple. Uh, and I just love the idea of him, you know, showing the kids all this stuff. Um, a couple other things. Uh, this is one of Mr. Barthé's uh, 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 folks on his crew. And this is what happens when you have a guy on the crew who's been working at a major hotel where there's what they call a Saturn medallion. And he comes home to his shotgun house in the Ninth Ward. And as Mr. B would say, wants to put a Cadillac finish on it. So you end up with this gigantic medallion from a lobby of a hotel inside a shotgun. And, and there are a number of people that actually created domes inside shotguns. It's sort of meditation chambers. And in the grand tradition of African visionary culture, there are a number of people who use those domes as places to imagine something very, very special that I'll tell you about in just 
just a moment, but let me show you one other um, member of Mr. B's crew, uh, Milford Dolio, straight out of the Creole world, uh, also worked on uh, cement, plaster, uh, lathing, and all that kind of stuff. And here he is, and he was the drummer um, for Onward Brass. And Mr. Barthay would say in a number of settings that, you know, this, this music... This, this work is like music. You know, the, the corbel arches are like the bass lines and the little tiny rosettes are like the high notes. And oh, by the way, uh, my daughter, uh, I'm sorry, my sister sings opera and uh, pla Carmen is the plasterer's beat. And at the same time, he's listened to Ray Charles and Muddy Waters. I mean, this beautiful commingled sense of identity that allows that to emerge outward is, is at the center of these building trades in the city. And not just the Creoles and the Afro-Creoles, but also, as I mentioned, German, Italian, Irish, the sort of the, the immigrant tradition. And many of them on the jobs did get along very well because the real question was, who can do the work? How quickly can you do it and how well can you do it? And, and that's sort of the same principle of soloing in music and jazz. Can you play the solo and can you, you know, move along and make a fast melodic head improvisation or you know, can you not play the solo? Can you finish the brick wall in a certain amount of time with really fine pointing or can you not do that? And so those who could do uh, in music got hired in the clubs and, and those who could do in the building trades did the work on the work sites. And, and in some ways, uh, race and ethnicity fell away in a lot of contexts that are important for the present day moment uh, after Katrina. I'll come back to that in a little while. But I want you to meet one other person. This is his, his museum shot day, and his name is uh, Allison Tootie Montana. All right, let's roll. Yeah! Gucci Fan, no say don't tell no lie. It's the music of the Mardi Gras Indians. We're not gonna let Katrina, y'all, turn us round. Congo beat in Louisiana, across the Caribbean. It's, it's a beat that in many ways is at the basis of rock and roll, a la New Orleans, the so-called weak beat accent you hear it in Fats Domino's music. There's Judy Montana doing something he does just three times a year. He's the chief of the Yellow Pocahontas. And I must admit, when I come to Santa Fe, I want to be very careful because of the questions of Indian identity. Um, Native Americans around the country are increasingly aware of the Mighty Gray Indians. And while some of the members of these groups, they call themselves tribes, do have Native ancestry, and of course, a lot of people have Native ancestry, they identify with Indians in a sort of symbolic way. They use sort of stylized Great Plains uh, and, and often Siouan costumes and assert their authority in the neighborhood. And they, and they give the narrative that whereas some people may have bent before the colonial powers, like Indians, their vision of Ro Indians as a romantic notion of history, they did not bend, they don't bow down, they don't break, they're tough, they're strong, they sing their songs, they walk the streets, and they don't take it from the cops, and they don't take it from the lighthearted. These are the Mardi Gras Indians. But here's the irony in Tutti Montana. He may be the chief of the Yellow Pocahontas, out singing this music that's at the base of so much New Orleans, and I would argue American popular music, with these deep African roots. And then what does he do, as he would say, 364 days a year? He's a lather. He's the guy with the dome in his house. But moreover, he's the guy that designs the facade on the Le Pavillon Hotel and works with a very multi-racial crew to make this happen. And where does he get that design? Well, it looks a little bit like some of the French neoclassical and, and uh, Victorian touches in the city. No question about it. But look closely, look closely at that grand sort of bas relief and then look down at the scrolls on the Indian costume down in the corner. And I asked Montana, you know, which came first? You know, those scrolls on the medallion or those scrolls on the costume. The reality is that for Mardi Gras Indians, being able to fabricate your costume often means pulling on some of these artisan trades to make something work. And so I said, why? What, you know, what's first? And he said, that's not the question. 
doesn't matter which came first. I dreamed these costumes. I look up inside that dome in my house and I dream them. Now, did the dream come from the work or did the dream come from some ancestral spirit? To him, that's sort of an irrelevancy. It's all of a piece. And it speaks to the kind of creolization of thought and the creolization of aesthetics, whether you're making the building facade or the Mardi Gras Indian costume. But of course, the tangible culture does not move. It's also not signed like great art. I happen to think that that whole facade is great art in a lot of ways. But the performance practice of being in the street as an Indian chief establishes who Tutti Montana is and makes it very, very significant that he too you know, leads the city in times of tri trial and trauma and, and trouble. More Mardi Gras Indians. Let me begin to turn to how things worked out after Katrina and talk a little bit about second lines and jazz funerals from the Social Aid and Pleasure Clubs. This is a jazz funeral for John Brunius playing the dirge in the street. Sorry about that. One more time on that little guy. Now let's get over. Here we go. Now you know how it begins. There's Brunius. By one of his relatives holding up the fan with his picture. Another jazz funeral for Tuba Fats. Great musician from the streets. All the great musicians of the city were out there, including this guy, Roger Lewis, who plays baritone sax for the Dirty Dozen and is on all the major Fats domino solos of the late 50s of records selling in the 110 million direction. And many of them are his, his Barry sax solos. But here he is out at a street parade. Now, these jazz funerals commingle West African notions of the spirit world as present and the possibility of the ancestors continuing to speak. Uh, also, obviously, the Christian idea that there is some kind of better life in the great beyond. So there's a sort of a fundamental split in jazz funerals, and it's this. After the dirge, this is what you get. Go upbeat. Once the body is left off at the cemetery, you head back towards town and people gather around and dance in the streets with you. And that's the notion of the second line. The first line are the pallbearers and the mourning family. The second line is all the folks who come out to hear this. And this fundamental formulation of the second line is not restricted to those sacred times of jazz funerals, but year round, particularly in the cool season, roughly between September, late, sometimes beginning at Labor Day and into April, these second lines uh, are, the, are the sources of pleasure and play and music for what are known as the social aid and pleasure clubs. These clubs are dominantly African-American, Afro-Creole, but they also had clubs for Irish and Italian and others over the years. To this day, though, it's mainly the Afro uh, people of color folks that continue with this tradition. And this music, the beginnings of jazz, are rooted in these clubs getting together and having their days of freedom and pleasure in the streets. And what you're, when you see a, and hear a social aid and pleasure club, yeah, you're thinking the pleasure. A lot of people in the second line want to come out and dance and drink, uh, you know, the second part of the jazz funeral or the parade for Mother's Day or for the black men of labor, whatever it is. But what's the other side of it? Social aid. Social aid speaks to that period uh, at the end of Reconstruction when the Jim Crow rules start getting enforced and the tide flip-flops in that direction. And one of the most restrictive history moments in American life and in New Orleans life, that's when jazz emerges. When questioned at one point, Ralph Ellison was asked, why have African Americans not created something at the level of the forefathers' constitution and bill of rights? And his response to what I think is a kind of a strange question was, oh, but we have a constitution and bill of rights. It's called jazz. In jazz, in the streets, in New Orleans, supporting the social aid and pleasure clubs, a freedom statement of intelligence, 
of improvisation, of wit, of joy, of dance. The social aid piece of it was helping people get medical attention, helping people have schools that they could go to, proper burial, all the things that went into social aid. Now, it's important, I think, to note that in New Orleans, pleasure is taken seriously. It's not seen as an add-on. It's not seen as a frivolity. People that wanted to cancel Carnival from outside New Orleans after Katrina and said, you don't do that, you shouldn't do that. New Orleanians said, that's ridiculous. Carnival, the pleasure of Carnival is embedded in who we are. And, you know, I was asked a couple of times in national radio shows and television, what about that? And I said, well, you can hear New Orleanians tell you that story, but let me put it to you this, this way. In World War II, when there was a battle, and it was winter time, and it was around Christmas, did the soldiers, when they could, get around a campfire and sing the Christmas carols? They did. You know, did Jews remember the high holidays? They did. Carnival, social aid and pleasure, these are all part of the New Orleans culture, and they were essential to continue in that moment. And Carnival writ large and the second lines became places where people could see the city one more time. They could come back in, and the first year of Carnival from Atlanta or Baton Rouge or Dallas or Houston or Los Angeles or New York, and they could kind of rehearse their return. They could see the cityscape at Carnival parading in the streets, see who was back. And similarly, year-round, these second lines function as a way to evaluate who's fixed up their house, who got the FEMA loan, whose store has been reopened. I mean, th this is the walking criticism of the society. This is the democracy of the streets of New Orleans. And you could argue that this is somehow trivial, I suppose, but I've got to say this about it. It is so embedded in the culture as important that the notion of social aid and pleasure then begins to be reconsidered by not just the people who are in the downtown Creole neighborhoods and the old societies, but you begin to have Tulane, my university, saying, come rebuild a great American city. Learn the culture. Social aid and pleasure. Learn the culture. Parade in the streets. Help rebuild the city. So it's suddenly an educational institution that's half a billion dollars down after this. And essential to the return of the city, the largest private employer is lauding the, essentially the values of the second line. And you know, all kids that go to college, they want pleasure. You know? I mean, I grew up in a New England town where, you know, uh, our social aid, we had a little Republican town council and the drunk under the bridge was always, had what he needed at night. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, there, there was always somebody taking care of the birds in the marshes. But there was no provision for pleasure in Old Lyme, Connecticut, where I grew up. That had to be found on your own. In New Orleans, though, the Afro-Latinity of it, it's in balance. And so it begins to penetrate up into the two lanes of the world. And a university that used to get 15,000 applicants is now getting 50,000. Because the articulation was of, come rebuild social aid, a great American city, and learn the culture. Pleasure. And, you know, kids want the pleasure. But now, framed together, if you can show up and do your job and take your tests and write your papers, as in after college, you can do what you need to do in your career, you know, the pleasure, no one's going to question that. I think it's a healthy balancing of Calvinist Puritan, puritanical America. I think the message from New Orleans about culture and the recovery is that you do need to have a good time. You do need to celebrate who you are in your family, your neighborhood, your culture, and your community. And believe me, when infrastructure wasn't being rebuilt, and I believe infrastructure really is in the category of a human right. We need to help people have infrastructure. But culture is at the basis of the return and the recovery. Listen to what Alan Toussaint had to say five years after those sad but hopeful comments um, that we listened to um, about 45 minutes ago. If I can find it here. In the catastrophe that followed Hurricane Katrina with the flood, your house was flooded, you lost your piano, you lost your music archives, and you had reflected to me that you had the spirit, there's no water line on music. Yes. <laughs> How do you look back on what happened now in terms of your life and your music? Katrina? Mm -hmm. Katrina was, uh, was what it was to what people could see with their eyes. But spiritually, Katrina was a baptism as far as I'm concerned. Many wonderful things came out of Katrina. Many, many. And it's still going on and will be going on forever. That's quite a jolt in life to have to flex new muscles in every way, physically and spiritually. 
So I, I find Katrina to be much more of a blessing than a curse, and not only for myself, but for most, for many who may not recognize it that way. I like to show this picture because it sort of looks like the second line in motion at, at a barber shop. <laughs> and actually, we talk about no waterline on culture. You may not be able to see it too well in this slide, but uh, given the light, but there's several water lines running through the side of this uh, barber shop. And remember, it was it was Toussaint that you know said no water line on the spirit. And you know, when when we would talk to our friends in the anthropology community, people would would say, you know, how's New Orleans doing? And we'd get into questions of material culture versus you know intangible culture. And I'd say, well, the material culture all has water lines on it. <laughs> the intangible culture that is about consciousness, spirit, symbol, belief, and identity, it doesn't have a water line. And that is the basis for how people could come back into the return and the recovery. And it wasn't just the old social aid and pleasure club, and the hippie club of the late 70s that helped to create a place for Professor Longhair to play in his late years called Tipitina's. I mean, it's such a kind of hippie logo, you know, like a banana peel in a hand like you're going to slip on the banana after you eat, you slip on the peel after you eat it. That became their post-Katrina logo that the famous banana hand is now underwater. But what did these guys do? They, they housed people. They fed people for months. They got brass band instruments into the place. They worked with the music rising from the Gibson Foundation and brought in sound systems. And in a sense, they did what the hippie version of a social aid and pleasure club would do. It gave people a place to play, but it also fed people and housed people and took care of them in this time of need.